um, now. So to start us off on the next um, session, we have Arcane Sight uh, talking about determinants of cohomology for number of people. Thank you, Wei. Um, so today I'm telling you a story um, uh, in arithmetic topology, which is a subject which studies the analogy between number of fields and three manifolds. Um, and the story is uh, based on the current work of Akshak. So um, <clears throat> to begin, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, number of fields and three manifolds. So um, Actually, I'll just start by just telling you about three manifolds. So I'll tell you a topological story in three manifolds, which uh, uh, our theorem gives a, an analog to an, for a number of fields. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and so to start, I'll just draw a picture of a three manifold, my rendition. So um, just draw it, and it has value two or something. Okay. And um, <clears throat> so this is a three manifold. And uh, so these objects uh, sort of can be analyzed in a couple of different ways, and one of them is through cohomology. So one thing you can do with a through manifold or any sort of differential manifold or topological manifold is consider its cohomology, um, which is an algebraic invariant that you associate uh, to your topological space, and you can associate it in a couple of different ways. One way you can do it uh, is sort of subdivide your space into cells of different dimensions. Um, and then uh, sort of get a bunch of sort of get a complex, and from this complex you can sort of um, tell how uh, sort of things about sort of the presence or absence of uh, holes of certain dimensions in your manifold. Um, and in particular, we're going to focus on one of these cohomology groups, which is the first cohomology group. Torsion and Z, and in fact, we're going to focus on the torsion model. So, um, in general, H1 and Z is just a abelian group. Um, if your manifold's got it, it's finite, uh, generated, and um, what this represents is sort of you can think of elements in here as sort of circles in your three manifold um, up to the boundary of surfaces embedded in your manifold. Okay. So you can think of these things as sort of formal sums of circles uh, with a relation that a circle is zero if, it's, uh, if, if, it, if it bounds sort of uh, some surface embedded in the map. And <clears throat> these cohomology groups actually come with a bit more structure. And I'm going to talk a bit about one extra bit of structure that they come with. And it's something called the linking pairing. So the linking pairing is going to be a map. Uh, it's going to be a bilinear map from the torsion homology of your three manifold uh, with value in Q mod Z. Okay. And um, the way to find this linking pairing is, um, is that you sort of want to count uh, how often one sort of circle loops around another. So if you take the linking pairing of A and B, you want to have some notion of the number of times one circle loops around another. So uh, I'm just going to draw a few circles. I'll start with a trefoil, try to draw it correctly. That looks okay. Um, then maybe you have another circle like that. Okay. I'm going to call the red one A and the second one B. And this linking pairing <clears throat> is defined in the following way. The linking of A and B it's been the following. So since it's a torsion class, it means that some multiple of it is zero in this homology. Some multiple of it is the boundary of an embedded surface. So I can uh, I can write down that B, for example is equal to, or M times B is equal to the boundary of some embedded surface. Yes. Then I can define my linking as being, as just counting sort of uh, the number of intersection points between A and the surface S, okay? 
if your surface is in general in left position and dividing by m. So it turns out that this a priori defines a class in Q, but it's well defined up to addition of things inside. Okay. So you should think of this as sort of counting how many times A sort of loops around D. In this case, M is going to be one because you see it's just the boundary of a disk. Um, but you can have sort of fractional loopings. So this turns out to be a bilinear structure on your torsion homology. And it turns out to be uh, symmetric. So the linking of A and D is equal to the linking of B and A. It's not completely obvious from this definition. But it's no, perfect. Yeah. So you define something, it's well defined torsion and also non torsion. Like you're not asking that A, like at least for the bit for the, the yeah, that's right. Ask anything on A. That's right. But is there a way to define it also if neither A or B are torsion? Um, yes, I mean, you can, you can sort of start making this definition and then uh, you can put some. And then you can check when it's sort of well defined. You'll get the number, um, and in some cases, it's well defined. So you, you have some linking also on the sort of uh, the free part, um, as long as sort of certain cases. So it turns out that this linking is symmetric. And um, <clears throat> One of the nice things about this thinking is sort of um, it's defined inside Q mod Z. So in Q mod Z, you can't divide by two uh, unambiguously. You have problems divided by two. And when you have a linear map, uh, you think back to linear algebra, the first thing you'd like to do is sort of ask about sort of norms. Okay, so by linear map, if you have a, a linear product, you want to ask about norms. And norms are sort of quadratic functions that refine, quote unquote, your bilinear pairing. But when you have trouble dividing by two, um, these sort of quadratic maps that refine your bilinear pairings are sort of not uniquely defined. You don't have a unique norm giving you the inner product. Basically, because in you know when you go through linear algebra, you have to divide by two at some point. Okay. And so in fact, you have many quadratic maps that sort of refine your linking pair. And so what I mean by this is that um, Many right, refinements. That means that there are many maps Q from H1 and Z version on Z that satisfy the property that Q of X plus Y minus Q of X minus Q of Y is equal to the linking of X here. And so so you're in a situation where you have some nice structure on your homology that could be sort of refined in many different ways. And it turns out there's an extra bit of structure you can put on your manifold that will distinguish one of these refinements. And it turns out what you need is a sort of ambient frame. I'm not going to say much more about that, but you sort of need an ambient sort of uh, Trivialization of your tension bundle that sort of varies continuously or smoothly over your manifold. That's enough to sort of distinguish one of these refinements. There. Which is not the same as asking for an orientation. Just stronger than asking for an orientation. Stronger? Like you will use actually the fact that you are. Yeah, you need, a, you need an oriented manifold. Okay. So, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I told you a story in topology, uh, which is that. If you have a bit more structure, you get some refinement of your uh, of some structure on the homology. And it turns out that uh, in the 1970s, uh, Mazur and Manin sort of found a, uh, a nice analogy between three manifolds and number fields. And in this analogy, uh, you think of your, of your number field, even spec Z maybe, as sort of a three manifold. And it has very a lot of very nice entries okay, uh, in this dictionary. So for example, you conceive of primes as just being knots in this three manifold, um, you conceive of tubular neighborhoods of this knot, sort of uh, <clears throat> the spectrum of the ring of integers, and the boundary of this tubular neighborhood, you conceive of it as uh, sort of piatic, uh, piatic, uh, as the piatic field. Okay, 
Um, and in this analogy of Maser, um, Maser and Manon, um, this first torsion homology corresponds to the class of the number field. So the class group of the number field is a, an invariant of your number field, um, which sort of measures how far the integers of the number field are from having unique factorization. Okay, so for example, having a class group which is trivial means you have unique factorization. Um, having a class group that has size two means you have a uniqueness of the lengths of the factorizations for each element to prime. The prime right? well, the prime. Um, <clears throat> And so it's natural to wonder what happens when you ask in this dictionary about the story I've just told you uh, for topological <laughs> animals. And uh, this is uh, the result of this. Can I? It's like the following thing. So, I'll just write an incantation. We have all the notation on the board. So we have K a number field. Um, mu, the roots of unity of K. Um, N, size of the roots of unity. Uh, P, the class group of K. See, do all the contrary and do all of this class group. So the set of homomorphisms from class group to Kumata. And now um, our theorem has two parts. Um, <clears throat> the first one is that uh, there exists a symmetric bilinear map. Um, from the duals of these class groups, the torsors of the duals of the roots of unity in your field. So this is one. Um, and this symmetric bilinear map encodes the arithmetic analogs of the linking pairing, for example. And the second part is that, furthermore, there exists uh, an odd k equivariant uh, map from a group, I'm going to say called spin K, to uh, quadratic maps going from C check to mu check bursars, where these quadratic maps refine the bilinear line. Uh, the symmetric bilinear map above. Okay. So they refine one. Um, so I'm going to tell you what the words mean. So uh, uh, spin K is sort of the set of spin structures of K. So it's the analog of this sort of piece of data up there. Thanks, sort of that different. Okay. And so <clears throat> you have a map that sort of and, and so this whole story is just sort of an analog of this story here. So the way you prove this is uh, in spirit a little bit like this thing, but it uses very, very different tools. Okay. That's typical of it's an arithmetic topology. Um, and uh, the last thing I'll say um, is that you can look at a similar situation. There's another analogy of number fields, which is with uh, sort of Function fields. Okay. And you can ask so, what's the analog of the linking pairing and our story in function fields? And it turns out that this story sort of rhymes with this theorem in the following sense. In that story, <clears throat> the role of the symmetric bilinear map is played by the lean pairing. And the lean pairing is refined by the determinant of cohomology. <clears throat> and so, our second part of our thing 
the term of cohomology is like not completely defined for number of fields. And so the second part of our theorem sort of gives you a candidate for some determinants of cohomology for number of fields. And that justifies my title. Um, that's it. Are there any questions? What, what is spin K? Uh, oh yeah, so spin K is uh, spin structures on K. And so uh, concretely they're uh, square roots of the inverse difference for the canonical bundle. So they're uh, alpha K star that uh, alpha K inverse is equal to alpha I square for some fractional ideal I. I ask you a very, very naive question. There's an analogy between spec Z and other number fields with three now. Why three? Uh -huh. So um, this comes from Mazur's computation of the etal cohomology um, of the spectrum of the ring of integers of a totally imaginary number field. And he found that it was just supported in the first three degrees, like zero, one, two, three. And then it was just zero everywhere. Um, over general number fields, there's like a version of point query duality, but where the sort of duality happens with respect to degree three. Do you have an explanation for this, or is this a pure coincidence of computation? No, I think it's. I, I think it was. It was. It wasn't expected before the computation was made. Yeah. I think one explanation: if you think two functions rather than to spec Z, you have over spec uh, that spec over a finite field, and for a finite field, the Galois group is Z hat or Z, so it's like a circle, and the favor is the curve of a algebraic number, which is something two dimensionally. So you can think to a curve or a finite field as a fiber bundle over a circle with fiber what you have over the algebraic clover. Okay. Great answer. <laughs> so, I guess how precise should we expect this analogy to be? Like should there be some like not associated to every prime or is that maybe too specific for what this is? Yes. Like? Too specific. Um, so, I mean, no one knows what all the entries of the dictionary should be. Not everyone even agrees with the objects that are on both sides. Um, but what should be true is that sort of phenomena that happen on one side should happen on the other. So, somehow, like if you have some sort of construction that uses a bunch of different things, it should sort of have some analog on the other side, maybe. Um, certain asymptotics for like counts should sort of behave in a similar way. So make single things. That's right, yeah. Statistical things should, uh, should have mirrors of it. It's the other side. All right. If there are no further questions, let's thank our team again.